Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none but violence, and hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly, he is just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord God. If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, that doeth the like unto any of these things, and that doeth not any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains, and hath defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abomination, hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase, Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Now, lo, if he beget a son, that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such life, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet say ye, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, then do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness he that hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Yet ye say, The way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, The way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not, shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. 
as we mentioned, Israel is falling apart. The nation is falling apart. Jerusalem is on the verge of being taken under siege and falling. And the people actually think that this is happening because of the sins of their ancestors, because of the sins of their forefathers. In verse 2, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? What the people are saying is they're saying, We're in the condition that we're in because our forefathers turned their backs on God, because our forefathers committed idolatry, because our forefathers committed abominations. And therefore, we're in this boat that we're in now. And so, what the situation we're in is going to happen. We're going to fall. So we might as well not even care. We might as well just live it up while we can and have some fun on the way out because what's going to happen is going to happen. And in doing this, they had shirked their responsibility. They were no longer taking responsibility for their own actions. And they were no longer seeing the connection between what was happening to their nation and what they were doing. At any time, at any time, there could have been a revival if the nation would have repented. God promised Israel in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, that after a time of idolatry and wickedness and backsliding and turning against the Lord, if that happened, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, the Lord said, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God said at any time, if they will humble themselves, pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. At any time, Israel could have done this, but they didn't. And this generation that is alive when Ezekiel is prophesying, when Jerusalem is getting ready to fall, they did not turn back to the Lord. They used their father's sin as an excuse, and they continued in sin. The popular thing to do in America today is to blame previous generations. I'm all messed up because my parents blew it. They like to point out the wrong things in American history. But the current generation has not shown the ability or willingness to stand on truth to do the right thing or turn to the Lord. In fact, many voices in the current generation blame God for the situation that we're in. And so we're going to see the same things happening in our society as well. In Ezekiel chapter 18, God tells the people that they're responsible for their own predicament. Each is accountable for his own actions. God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. And God calls men to repent. First, each is accountable for his own actions. If we look in verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. All souls belong to God. All souls are accountable to God. The son's soul is not owned or accountable to his father. Therefore, the son's soul is neither saved nor is the son's soul condemned by the actions of his father. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a preacher that had made a name for himself and he once spoke of witnessing the Elvis Presley. Got in an elevator in Las Vegas. What he was doing in an elevator in Las Vegas is beyond me, this preacher, but maybe he is there soul winning. But he gets in an elevator, and there's Elvis Presley in the elevator with him. And he asked Elvis if he knew he was going to heaven if he died. And, and Elvis kept telling him, yes, I'm a Christian. My mama always went to church. I'm a Christian. My mama always did this. I'm going to heaven. My mama always did this. And, and this preacher told this story. And what, if this story is true, what Mr. Presley didn't understand was what his mama did was not going to get him into heaven. Mr. Presley was going to stand before God in the judgment on his own. The actions of your parents, the actions of your father will neither get you into heaven nor will they condemn you to hell. You will be judged based on what you did with the gospel and with Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse 4, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Condemnation comes with sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. 
You sin, you'll earn the wage for sin, and the wage for sin is death. It's condemnation. The condemnation comes to the soul that sinned. Not to the children of the soul that sinned, but to the soul that sinned. That's where the condemnation goes. And so God goes on this great big illustration of this concept from verse 5 to verse 18. God illustrates this by contrasting fathers from sons. You have a father, he does everything the right way. He has a son who is just a wretched individual. The father's going to live, the son's going to die. Now that son who's a wretched individual has a son and that son decides to do things the right way. The son of the wretched individual is going to live, but his father's going to die for his iniquity. And so what this teaches us is even when our parents have made bad decisions, we still have the capability of rising above that and choosing to serve God with our lives. And, and God will reward that and he'll hear you. So you look at this in verses 5 through 9. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right and hath not eaten upon the mountains, that means he's not engaged in idolatrous worship, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, he's staying faithful to God, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, he's staying faithful to his wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, we'll skip that one, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, he has paid his bills, hath spoiled none by violence, he has been fair to everyone, hath given his bread to the hungry, he's a generous man, hath covered the naked with a garment, he's taking care of others. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase. This man is not a loan shark. He's not dishing out payday loans. He's not dishing out auto title loans. He's not loaning you five bucks and demanding you pay him back fifteen dollars. You need five bucks, he'll loan you five bucks, and then when you can pay him the five bucks back, you're even. That's what kind of guy this is. That hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. And so God gives us the model individual there. That guy that God described is an alright guy, isn't he? He's a great man. He's following what the Lord has taught him to do in his word. Now have you ever noticed a great man who has a rotten son? Now sometimes we try to blame the parents for that. But sometimes you have a son that just goes rotten. Cain and Abel had the same parents, Adam and Eve. Same upbringing. I believe that Adam was probably pretty faithful to God after, the, after chapter 3 in Genesis. I believe that Adam became the, uh, the patriarch of the family that led his descendants to stay faithful to God. But you have Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Two sons. One of them is marked by his faith, Abel. One of them is a murderer, Cain. So you can have a great man who has a rotten son. And that rotten son is described in verses 10 through 13, does the opposite of everything dad did. This rotten son is a robber, a shedder of blood. He likes violence and doeth the like to any of these things. And that doeth not any of those duties, but hath eaten, even hath eaten upon the mountains and defiled his neighbor's wife. So he's engaged in idolatrous worship and he is being unfaithful to his wife. Hath oppressed the poor and needy, taken advantage of people, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, so he is not paying his bills, he's lifted up his eyes to the idols, and hath committed abominations, hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase. This guy is a loan shark. He's working in Vegas. Shall he then live? He, he shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. So you have the great man, the father. You have the rotten man who is that great man's son. The father's going to live. The son's going to die. Now this rotten man has a son. And as I mentioned earlier, he's going to do everything that his granddaddy did. He's going to do everything right. He's going to live. So the conclusion from this line of thinking that God gives us in verse 20 the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. You live a sinful life against God and rebellion to God, you're going to reap the consequences for that, which is going to be God's condemnation. 
you turn from your sins and you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God will receive you into heaven. You live a life in service to the Lord and you put God first in all things and you walk in God's word and his statutes, God will reward you for that. It doesn't matter what the person next to you does. And when you stand before God in the judgment, you're not going to have the excuse, well, the person next to me was an ungodly person, so he, he prevented me from doing all the godly things. God's going to hold you accountable for your actions. There's going to be no excuses, and there's going to be no free passes. Romans 14, 10 through 12 says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Each and every one of us will one day stand before the Lord, and we will give an account of ourselves of ourselves to God. We will not give an account of our fathers. We will not give an account of our children. We will give an account of ourselves before God. Each one of us will be held accountable for what we did. So everyone is accountable for himself. Second, God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. God takes no pleasure in sending people to hell. By the way, out of the doctrines of grace... Calvinism, God takes no pleasure in condemnation. So he would not have created man for the sole purpose of condemning man because he takes no pleasure in condemnation. Verse 23, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? God took no pleasure from the destruction of Jerusalem, the captivity, or the destruction of the nation. God took no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. And he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in seeing people locked away in TDCJ because they did wicked things. He takes no pleasure in seeing lives destroyed and seeing families fall apart. He takes no pleasure in that. But it happens because wicked people make wicked choices. God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked or the condemnation of sinners. But he has to condemn sinners and allow the wicked to be destroyed because of his righteousness. He has to stay true to his law. He cannot break his own law. But he created an escape from his law so that the wicked could turn from his way and be saved. In John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, now know when you hear that, you think, you're already saying it in your mind, and you're thinking children's church, Sunday school class, this is basic stuff, but let's look at what God actually says here. He said, Jesus says in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, condemnation is what the Affordable Care Act would describe as a pre-existing condition. It's something you already have. It's something you're already dealing with. It's something you already face. You are born into this world a sinner condemned. But God, in his love for us, sent his only begotten son to take that condemnation upon himself on the cross so that we can be saved if you repent of your sins and trust him as Savior. He provided that way of escape. He provided that way of salvation, that way of escape from his wrath. One, because he loves us, and two, because he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. God's will is for the wicked to turn from his wicked ways. Not so he can destroy the wicked to show how great he is, but that the wicked would turn from his ways. That is God's goal. That is God's desire. And as being God's people, that should be our goal and our desire. Our goal is to see the people who are currently residing across the street to one day be in our services... Not looking for handouts, but looking to worship the Lord because He has, because His Spirit has convicted their hearts of their sin and they have repented of that sin and trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That is the goal. The Lord takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. And so if the Lord takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, what's He going to do but call the wicked to repentance? In verses 21 and 22, But if the wicked will turn from... 
all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right he shall surely live he shall not die all his transgressions that he hath committed they shall not be mentioned unto him in his righteousness that he hath done shall he live the wicked man that repents shall live and the Lord will not bring his wickedness back up now some, you might know somebody that you might have gotten into a disagreement with maybe you offended them and you go back and you apologize say I'm sorry I offended you and they say no don't worry about it it's okay I forgive you and then two weeks later you're talking to that person and they're upset with you and why are you upset with me and it's like they have a Rolodex of everything you've ever done you remember when you did this and that, well you know what you've turned from from offending them but they still remember what you did and they still bring it up God is not going to manipulate you like that. God is going to put your sin away and he's not going to bring it back up because you turn from your wicked ways because you repented. We look in verses 30 and 30 through 32. And this is God's plea and this is the problem I have with the doctrines of grace because the doctrine of Calvinism because Calvinism teaches that God created some to be saved and to be glorified with him and he created others to be destroyed. Well, if that's the case, why is he pleading with sinners and wicked people to repent? Verses, and he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. So in verses 30 through 32, Therefore will I, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his way, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so that iniquity shall not be your ruin. Turn from your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruins. Turn from your sin so that your sin will not destroy you and leave you condemned at the end of your life. In verse 31, cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Y'all ever seen the movie Fireproof? All right. The main character in Fireproof, played by Kirk Cameron, had a problem with the computer. And so he had to get that out of his life. Kids, y'all don't get any ideas. But he took the computer out in the backyard and he smashed it with a baseball bat. He cast away all his transgressions by smashing the computer with a baseball bat. Y'all just don't get on my computer. All right? don't get any ideas but that's what we have to do so oftentimes we bury the hatchet but we leave the handle sticking out All right. God wants us to cast our sin away from us and what will happen the Bible says he will make you a new heart and a new spirit why will you die O house of Israel so if you have the computer problem or you have the the alcohol problem or you have the anger problem or you have the adultery problem whatever the problem is whatever sin you're struggling with and you're, and you're thinking about giving into it ask yourself is this worth dying over because if you continue in it you will die over it and you will be judged for it in verse 32 for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth saith the Lord God wherefore turn yourselves and live ye. God has no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. So he calls the wicked to repent. Each of us will stand alone on Judgment Day. How's that looking for you? Will you stand before God as a child of God who's turned from his sin and trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior? Or will you stand before him as one that rejected his son, electing rather to try to get into heaven by his own righteousness? Will you stand before God as a child of God who lived for God? Or a child of God who squandered his or her time on this earth, chasing fleshly things? How does judgment look for you? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the rain this afternoon. Father, there are a number of requests that are on our hearts. Father, we pray that you'd see those according to your will. And Father, we ask you for strength through this week. Father, we ask you for guidance through this week. And Father, we pray that you'd give us the boldness to carry out your word wherever we go. 
We ask you to forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all are dismissed.